and allow us to be in your presence, God, so that we would live eternally set free forever from the bondage of sin. And so, God, right now, we just pray that you will be glorified in this place. May the name of the Lord Jesus be uplifted today. And, Lord, may we be quick to exalt you for all that you've done, all that you are, and all that you will continue to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, good, good. Well, today, if you came to Heart Change Fellowship, you came on the right day because we will be having some food after church for our uh, biannual meeting. And I, I know the menu. Um, only a couple of us actually know the menu, but it's going to be good. So uh, please stick around. We're going to be talking more about sort of our direction and talk about how we're doing as a church, but then also really having some time for us to be able to really celebrate and even thank God for what he's doing at Heart Change Fellowship as well. Amen. You know, one of the things that's, uh, you know, exciting is that we've been going through this series really talking about Jesus in the book of Colossians called The Greatest of All Time. And one of the specific aspects that we talked about last week was this idea of, of Facebook philosophers. Uh, uh, Brother Joel and I know that we've been having a running conversation probably for the past couple of years about folks on Facebook who generally try to appear really smart, but when you meet them in person, they probably they don't have a lot to say. And so, you know, you hear people saying all sorts of crazy stuff like, you know, I, I did it because, you know, you know, I just tried hard and I believed and it just happened. And I'm just so thankful. Um, but, but really, it's more of an internal look at what they've done in their effort instead of saying, God, I really appreciate you for what you've allowed me to accomplish. You know, it's funny because even on Facebook now, I mean, they said it's, it's over, you know, I forgot how many, a billion people are now on Facebook. I mean, imagine that, over a billion people are on Facebook now. And, and I mean, it's even more than that. What's the exact number, Chris? Okay, because I knew, I knew Chris would know that number. And, yeah, it's something crazy like that. We're all on Facebook. And what's crazy about it is you can find whatever interest you have, whatever interest group you want to be a part of, you can find it on Facebook, right? So say if you love animals, you know, you're a cat lover, a dog lover, you can find... You can find your people on Facebook. All the dog lovers of the world unite together, and we love, we're going to love dogs together, right? You know, if you like eclectic music, you find them all on Facebook. You know, whether it be, you know, your favorite movie, you know, I'm going to get you sucker. You know, you can find all the I'm going to get you sucker lovers from, from back in 88 on Facebook. And so you see all these different types of people. You see all different types of issues. Some of us love having Facebook discussions with other people. Some of us don't, but you can find all types of interests on Facebook now. But what's amazing is that if we look throughout history, we'll see that there are different uh, types of people who really have a, a tremendous concern about particular interests. You know, no matter if you're in the 21st century or you're looking back in the first century. And so today we're going to look at some folks who, who were literally, who had some vested, some vested interests of their own to really try to impact how Christians even saw God. And so if you would, go ahead and turn to Colossians chapter 2. Um, and the title of my message today is Facebook Philosophers Part 2. Facebook Philosophers Part 2. Because with these other philosophers from the first century, they literally tried to dominate the church of Colossae. But in order to really talk about what we're going to talk about today in verses 8 through 10, we really need to understand verses 6 and 7, because it helps us to, to gain a better perspective. Verse 6, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to, to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So we talked about this last week, that, that if we are to literally walk in Christ, that we must be rooted in him, that we must have a foundation that's really centered in Christ. And so what Paul is saying here significantly is that if, we are, if, if we're walking in Christ, if we're rooted in Christ, 
that literally he says to have no one take us captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So I'm going to be talking about two points today. One is just having confidence in what we believe, but also having confidence in who we believe. Confidence in what we believe and then confidence in who we believe. Literally, what Paul is saying here is having the ability to distinguish God's truth from the truth that's of the world. And so if you're sitting there and you're thinking about this as, as I'm approaching the text, I want you to think about a question. Where does my belief system come from? Where, where does my belief system come from? Does it come from my mom and dad and that's just, this is just how they raised me? Does it come from my, my grandma or my grandfather? Does it come because I just learned a bunch of things in culture that said this is what's acceptable or this is what's not acceptable? Because for each of us, we have a belief system that we hold on to that we, that we make decisions based out of. And so for each of us, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, if we have a particular belief system, is the belief system that we have, is it consistent with the Word of God? Is it consistent with the Word of God? Because... If it is, it's going to cause us to live and think a certain way. And if it's not, it's going to cause us to live and think a certain way as well, right? And so we see here that Paul first says that no one take you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. You know, one of the things that we learn about, about this, this church in uh, Colossae is that it was a, a Grecian church inf- influenced by Greek culture. And one of the things that we know specifically about Greek culture is they love philosophy. They love the new idea of the day. They love the new thought that was on the scene because they thought that if they knew it, then they would be smarter people. You know, Greek culture has, has brought us Plato and Socrates or Socrates and Aristotle. You know, all of these different people. Some of y'all will get that later. Just let it sink in. So we, we see that Greek culture gave us all of these philosophers, philosophers that even today people read about. You know, even some, some historians even talk about platonic theory even still affecting how we view a lot of things in our world today. And so we see this mindset here. And what Paul is saying is that, that Jesus is not speaking against philosophy in general, but just really the kind that contradicts the gospel message. Because these types of of teachings talk about Jesus really not being sufficient. Literally a mindset that says that I don't really need God because my intellect carries me. Man, sounds sounds like somewhere else that we know, right? Maybe like Boston, Massachusetts. (laughs) You know, I said this last week, that mindset that says, literally, I'm all set. I got this, Lord. And so in, in terms of understanding God, it's like, God, you know, you're, you're here. Like, you can have this, this right here of my life. But the rest of this, this area of my life, this, this is all mine. Like, this is all mine. Lord, I'm going to come to you when there's trouble or when there's a, a big concern that I'm not sure of. But, but everything else over here, I'm going to control. I'm going to control my job. I'm going to control my time. I'm going to control my finances. Like, everything is all in this, over, this little area. And God, you just take care of this right here. And if I need you, I'll come back to you. You know, what's amazing is this wasn't just the first century, was it? (laughs) This wasn't just the first century. This was now. Let me go on. He says, according to human tradition, he was talking specifically to the Jews. And this is what's going to be talked about next week more so is that the Jews were literally masters of human tradition, right? They had all these different traditions. In the Old Testament, how many, how many laws were in the Old Testament? Anyone know the answer? 600 and what? Close, 613. 613, good job, Calvin. 613 laws in the Old Testament. I mean, amazingly, right? And we see in the, in the Torah, rather, and so the first five books of the Bible. And so what we see is something significant that even in the first century, you see, all, you see the, the Pharisaic mind, the Pharisees, who literally wanted, the, uh, they wanted to often trap Jesus, right? We see that in, in Matthew chapter 15, when Jesus was with his disciples and, and you know, they were getting ready to have a meal. 
And the Pharisees came up to him and said, Jesus, why don't your disciples wash their hands? Like, come on, bruh. Like, like you about to, you're getting ready to eat. And you know the tradition of the elders is for hands to be washed. If they were more concerned about the condition of the disciples' hands than they were about the condition of the people around them who were suffering. And that's what Jesus spoke to. He really, literally spoke to their tradition. And I say that because in that first century, when we look at Colossae, there were these Jewish Christians who were entering the church and really trying to say, well, you need to obey the Old Testament law, all of the Old Testament law, and serve Jesus. When we know that Jesus came to glorify the Father by bringing in a new covenant, a new way of approaching God. And I say that even with that example, like I'm a firm believer in, in hand washing. Can I get an amen from someone? Amen. amen. Lord knows what goes on in some men's bathrooms. Wash them hands. That's all I'm going to say. Wash them hands. <laughs> right? But we see here that this idea of tradition, again, we're going to talk more about that next week, according to the elemental spirits of the world. That the Colossian Gentiles have sometimes mixed their philosophies with their Christian principles. And so they would try to mix in some of, the th- some of the things that they believed about some of their philosophies. And we're going to talk about that more so in a second. But literally, the mindset was that, that Jesus wasn't good enough. Like Jesus alone wasn't good enough. That the word of God wasn't just good enough. That the power of God through Christ wasn't good enough. And so what he's saying here is that any Knowledge, any form of philosophy, any form of, of, of wisdom that really tried to, 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 that was really sort of the, 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 the most respected ideal of the society, what he's saying is it's literally an elemental teaching in comparison to Jesus. That no matter how smart you think you are, it doesn't compare to Christ. That no matter how, 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 how great you think you are, that, that, that literally, that, you, that, that, that God is so much greater than the belief system that you have. And so when we look at these verses, you know, we can often see it in such a way where it can sometimes be disconnected from the reality that we go through, right? But we know that we live in a society now where there are philosophies that often impact us and we may not even be paying attention to it, Right? What, do we, what does it look like? Like for some of us, when we look at other faiths, right? You know, we live in New England, and New England is like ground zero for the, the Unitarian Church. You know, Unitarian churches are all over Boston. You know, we see different markers of Unitarian churches, right? Believing that that's pretty much, quote unquote, all roads lead to God, that I can, I can worship Buddha, or I can, you know, worship Muhammad, and then I can worship Jesus, and they just sort of all lead to God. You know, one of the things that I will say about them is they have done a really good job of of loving people who have been ostracized by churches. Because people feel hurt, you know, they feel wounded, and they say, well, let me go be around some people who are really going to, quote unquote, accept me for, for who I am. And they sort of have all those types of people come in, right? But on the reverse side, if you understand the belief system, you see a lot of holes in it. Really, because for those same people are hurting, how many of those people are actually led to the gospel of Jesus Christ for their healing? Like how many of those people are led to the cross to say, only in him is he the one who is, a, your great, who is the great physician who can heal you? That doesn't really happen. Also, we see that in Matthew chapter 28, we see the Great Commission that we are commanded to go and make disciples. And so literally, it's not just about us sort of staying in the holy huddle and just saying kumbaya and saying, yeah, you know, you're my friend, you make me feel good. But literally, it's to go out and tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ, about how he changes and transforms lives. And so if you look at a, a Unitarian church, they're not preaching the gospel. They're not going to missions and going all over the world to tell others about Christ. It just doesn't happen. Additionally, Jesus said it in John 14, 6. He said, I am the what? I'm the way. I'm the truth and I'm the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. And so that's pretty exclusivistic. 
I mean, if, 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 if you want to take him at his word, that really like that because he was the only one to literally come and give his life for us so that we would be able to know God, so that we would be in relationship with the father, that he's the only one that died. And so all of those other religions are sort of man's attempt to try to get to God. And the beauty of, of the Christian experience, the beauty of Jesus is that he's the only one that came down for us so that we would be able to have newness and, and freedom in Christ. Amen. And so when you look at sort of the Unitarian mindset, there are a lot of different holes. Because at the end of the day, even though it quote unquote calls itself a church, it's not the church of Jesus Christ. And so for some of us here in New England, that may be our place of worship, but it's really not a place of worship where the name of Christ is being uplifted. And we see that in so many other society, places in society as well. You know, throughout our city, you know, one of the things as Christians that we need to learn how to do is really how to how to dissect culture. That Jesus came as the first missionary sent from the Father as a missionary to this world to really just sort of to model what it meant to have freedom with the Father. And because he was the first one who was sent that for each of us, and he dissected the culture, he, he understood about the Pharisees, he understood about the Sadducees, he understood about, about those who were poor, he understood about all those who were rich. And he was able to dissect it in a way that brought healing to the masses and brought healing to the nations. And for us as believers, what God calls us to do as well is to dissect our culture so that when you're driving around Boston or you're at your job or you're interacting with people at a store, but how do you dissect the culture? Because if we're believers in Christ, we need to always be dissecting so that we can pray. And in, in, in certain instances, be able to be used by God no matter what he says do. Like, for example, some of the idols that we have here in Boston, I shared this last week. For some of us, it's our busyness. That we want to prove how busy we are. We want to tell people, you know, I worked 70 hours this week as a badge of honor. But of, of those 70 hours, how much time did God really get from your life? And then, you know, we talk to the next person and they tell you about working 80 hours, right? And then it's just trying to one up. Well, I had to work 80 hours. And I, you know, I worked the 12 to 12 shift, you know, and I worked the so-and-so shift, right? I mean, I'm studying. I'm, I'm going to two schools right now. It's like a badge of honor. You know, also like where we attended college, you know, that's the big one as well. Like, oh man, I went to MIT, oh I went to Harvard, oh I, I graduated from this from this university. And so this idea of, of these, these this this sense of idolatry. Another one, and I may lose some friends on this, is is, pre, is pleasure seeking. That for some of us we're looking for like the next big thrill, the, the next big party, the next big trip out of Boston because I get to leave. <laughs> and we can do that not even paying attention that we're, that we're in this cycle of self, of just focusing on us and not really looking at our lives in the sense of saying, God, how can my time even be, how can my recreational time even be redeemed for you? You know, I love traveling as well. But when I think about that more than I think about Jesus and I think about how I can be a blessing to others, it needs to be questioned. Now, for some of us, that's a big issue. For others of us here in Boston, our idol could be our neighborhood we live in, right? You know, this is probably the only city you go to outside of New York where you see, like, you know, Doc. I'm, I'm in Dorchester. What's up? You know, I'm in Dorchester. I'm in Roxbury. You know, jokers get excited about the neighborhoods they live in. You know, I'm from Southie, you know. I'm from Westie. I'm from Eastie, right? You know, people get excited about their neighborhoods. And that can even be a sense of idolatry as well, because you live or you've come from a specific neighborhood. And so there are all these different idols that we have in our culture. And what Jesus is saying is that he wants to be the one to, to, to have our affection. And anything that is outside of his will is literally considered to be sinful. Amen? And so if we 
understand the text here, what, what, what Paul is saying here is that these philosophies, anything that sets itself or tries to exalt itself against Christ is sin. That's why he says in verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Who is he talking about? There you go. He's talking about Jesus. That's the easiest Sunday school answer that you could ever give. He's talking about Jesus, right? And you have been filled in him who was the head of all rule and authority. He is the fullness. And so what was taking place here with the, with the Gnostics, they were the, the, the big group in Colossae. And literally what they tried to do is they tried to deny Christ's deity. They said that, 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 that yeah, Jesus was, was quote unquote God, but he wasn't man. And so you saw that they believed that God started the world in motion and that God sort of just said, all right, you, 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 you people do your thing. Like, like because they saw God as sort of being sort of above people and not really interacting, that, that God sort of set things in motion and stepped away. And because of it, they believe literally that everything that we see around us is evil and that only God is good. And because of that, that people could generally live however they wanted to live. And so you can imagine if you're, you're a Christian and you're a new Christian really trying to follow Jesus and someone comes in and says, well, you know that you can live whatever way you want to live. You see that shorty over there? Well, you can worship Jesus and go over there too, right? And you can have this business and you can sort of take some money and cheat people if you want to. And so these types of individuals were, were coming into the church and we're trying to infiltrate the church, literally saying that, that it wasn't, like Jesus wasn't sufficient. I mean, can you imagine the Facebook page of a, of, a, of a agnostic person? I mean, because they literally thought that in order to grow closer to God, that you had to, you had to have some special revelation from God. And only the Gnostics believed that they had the special revelation. And so in order to, to sort of grow closer to God, you had to be validated through their leaders, which is crazy. And so for them, it was literally sort of they were sort of they, they created their own belief system to sort of keep sort of like people at bay. I mean, I can't I can't imagine their Facebook page. Like if you see them, I mean, they're probably like like stunting, like yeah, like you know, I'm like like we know everything, you know, had long beards, you know, like like come and talk to me, because I got it going on. I, I know exactly what God is saying. Like yeah, I know Jesus said this, but listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I heard from God, right? We see this today on TV, right? All the time. Come get this word from the Lord. <laughs> come buy this prayer cloth. You know, watch my hand go like this, you know, and go like this and go like this. You know, if you just if you just give your seed, you get all that you need. Right. Uh Oh. <laughs> and so we have all of these sort of like quick fixes today. But all of those quick fixes really communicate that Jesus, that his word is not good enough, that the power of who he is is literally not good enough. And that's what was going on in the first century. That, that what Paul is saying is that, that God is complete, that he's completely present in Christ, that Christ is sufficient for anyone, including the Colossian church, and that all they hoped to find in philosophy was literally fulfilled in Jesus. Man, mm. is anyone excited about the fullness of God, that Jesus was the fullness of God, that, that, that he, like, he never said, you know, I said this about a month ago, that, that Jesus never said, look at, Chris, look at your life, man. I'm, I'm only, when you pray to me, I'm only going to give you a certain percentage of my love. Like, I'm only going to give you a certain percentage of my character. That I'm going to only give you a certain percentage of my grace. But what God did in, in Christ is, is, is that, that he literally said, I'm going to give you everything. That I'm going to give you my whole heart. That I'm going to give you my, my, my whole being. That I'm going to, I'm going to die for, for all of you because I've given all of me. And because of it, we're able to understand the fullness of God. Because understanding the fullness of God is, is who Christ is. Because he is the deity of God. Because when we understand the fullness of Christ, I'm thankful for it. Because the fullness of God is literally what Christ came to do and redeem. 
That the fullness of God literally came to, to, to heal us. The fullness of God came not only to save us, to keep us in him and to, to make sure that we would be steadfast and immovable in him. That the fullness of God came to restore us when we've fallen short. The fullness of God came to encourage us when we are literally wounded and on our last breath. The fullness of God came to love us even when we don't love ourselves. Jesus Christ is the fullness of God. And if we ever forget it, we need to repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry for, for accepting the things of this world and seeing the philosophies of this world or seeing my, my pleasure or my comforts or the things that make, me, that make me look good and feel good above you, Lord. We need to repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. That's why Jesus in John, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture, John 1, 14, and the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of only the only son from the father, father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Man. <clears throat> Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us. He didn't just come to die on the cross. He came to model what it meant to live in obedience to the father. And because of it, he models it for us so that we will be able to have hope in this world as well. Amen. You know, last week, Echo and I, we went to a conference. We went to a conference for our denomination. And it was in Western Mass. And it was a really good conference. Part of it was, was talking about some different areas to really consider uh, in culture and really think about things theologically. But one of the things I was really encouraged with is to know that as a denomination, our church is part of a denomination called the Evangelical Free Church of America. Uh, a lot of the, the professors who write books for different seminaries are professors at our seminary. Uh, you know, we're, you know, by God's grace, God has really blessed, you know, our denomination has some really influential thinkers, which has been awesome. But one of the things that he talked about was our doctrinal statement. And in the doctrinal statement, there's some really specific things that are said about Jesus uh, as, a, as a movement. And it's also the doctrinal statement that we have as a church as well. And so what I want to do is I want to read part of it because I think what it does is it really helps us to, to have a, a greater context as to Jesus really being the fullness of God. It says that we believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, literally that he appeared in the flesh, fully God and fully man, one person and two natures. Jesus, Israel's promised Messiah, was conceived through the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He lived a sinless life, was crucified under Pontius Pilate, arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father, and our high priest and advocate. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hmm. That, that, that he was able to, to come into a world, into a fallen world, and literally communicate that he had victory that he had victory that literally that he came in grace and truth that he literally came in, in, in grace and love you know one writer Tim Keller once said that love without truth is sentimentality it supports and affirms us but keeps us in denial without our flaws truth without love is harshness some of us know some people who are truth without, without love, right? Hopefully it's not in our marriage, but I won't keep going. I won't go on. It gives us information, but in such a way that we cannot really hear it. God's saving love in Christ, however, is marked by both radical truthfulness and about who we are. And yet, also radical, unconditional, committed to us. Commitment to us. The merciful commitment strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and repent. To conviction and repentance moves us to cling to and rest in God's mercy and grace. To be able to rest in the mercy and the grace of God because of what Jesus gave to us. That he came in truth out of his infinite love. 
And so that because Christ came to, 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 to model to us what it meant to live to please the Father, to live in that infinite grace, he gave it to us so that we could literally give it to others. That we need God's grace every day if we're going to navigate this Christian life, right? We need it every day. Lord knows I need it. Because if I didn't have the grace of God in my life, I'd be the most selfish, narcissistic dude you can imagine. Prideful, wouldn't care about other people. Like for certain people, if they, if they, if before they came to Christ, they might still be nice people, even though they would be Christians. For me, I know I'd probably be a jacked up dude. I wouldn't care about nobody. I'm just, I'm just going to be honest with you. And so I know <laughs> it's nothing but the grace of God. I'd be the most prideful, resentful, angry guy you can imagine. Because I had a lot of that before I knew Jesus. So I just know if, if Christ hadn't saved my life, man, it just wouldn't have been good. But for each of us, we need his mercy and his grace daily. Amen? And we need his grace and mercy so that we're able to give grace to others when we're called to give grace to people who are unlovely sometimes. We need his grace we need his mercy because we literally have to give it to others. We need his forgiveness because he's already forgiven us. Mm, thank you, Jesus. And so because of it, we can literally have the confidence to walk in Christ because, of he, because he is the one that we believe. Why? Because we've been filled in him. Hallelujah. We've been filled in him. Mm, man. See, the blessing... I'm about to end on this, is that because Christ gave us the fullness of who he is, so that we would be able to walk in him, literally, folks, we don't have to dwell in our past sin. That we don't have to dwell on the things that kept us away from Christ Jesus. That we are able to really walk in the newness of life. Man. Mm. See, one of the things that I get encouraged about is, is, is understanding when there's life transformation that happens in our church. Because we've seen those who have, who have not been walking with Jesus literally come and say, God, I want to accept your love and your grace. And that's the blessing of the local church is that we have opportunities to be encouraged by those stories and to encourage other people to hear about how God really moves in people's lives. And one of the blessings of our, our life groups is that literally, like we have folks who have come in of, in all walks of life. We've had folks who have come to our life groups who weren't believers. We have folks who've come in who were new Christians. We have folks who come in who have been Christians for a long time, who are caught up in a lot of different struggles. A lot of different struggles. You know, we've had people who have been struggling with alcoholism, struggling with pornography, struggling with, uh, with, with different addictions. Struggling with all different types of things, fear, you know, laziness, like you name it, you go down the list. But one of the things that's encouraging is that through the community of the group, there is encouragement to know that as a believer in Christ, that you don't have to live this life by yourself because God never designed for you to be able to live it by yourself. And so because of it, that you're able to literally, what I say is walk in the lights, that you can have a, a, a particular struggle. But the encouragement and where God is, is when you walk in the light, when you're able to admit the issue and admit the sin and say, Lord, I'm going to surrender it to you, but I'm not just going to deal with it by myself in the closet between me and you, because I need accountability. I need the right men and the right women around me to encourage me as I'm going through this so that when I feel the struggle in my heart, I can shoot out a text or call somebody and say, Joe, I need you to pray. Joel, I need you to bring me some chicken, right? <laughs> Fellas know what I'm talking about, chicken on deck. That we all need that. Because if we are literally to have confidence in, in what we believe and confidence in who we believe, the way God designed it is for each of us to be able to have people around us to walk with us, to encourage us, and to literally let us know that we're not in this thing by ourselves. Amen? Amen. And so that's the beauty of Jesus, is that as we, we understand this text here, the significance of this text is that we're able to be filled in him because Christ is the head of all rule and authority. Man, we're going to 
spend some time in prayer before we have communion. But I know for some of us, we might be here today and we say, Lord, if I'm honest with myself, I'm still struggling with some of the things that, 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 that keep me from you. I'm still struggling with some of the same issues of my heart. I'm struggling with the same lies that I'm believing from the enemy. Like I'm still bound up by some things that I just, I just haven't even been able to forgive myself of. That I want to give you an opportunity right now just to pray and just to say, Lord, I'm sorry if it's an error you need to repent of. Or to say, Lord, will you literally speak to my heart to really give me healing of areas in my life that I know it's been hard for me to forgive myself. Because for each of us, the beauty of Christ is knowing that no matter where we've come from, no matter what we've done, no matter what experiences we've been through, we know that we have a Savior who loves us insatiably. And everything that you've gone through and everything you're going through right now, he desires to literally bring healing to you if you just surrender it to him. And so what I'm going to do is invite the worship team to come back up. And I'm going to pray for us. And I want to give you just an opportunity right now just to really pray about what God may be speaking to you in this moment. Jesus, we are thankful for the power of the gospel because the gospel of Jesus Christ literally changes lives. Relationships often get restored. Families are often brought back together. Communities begin to be transformed. Areas of hurt begin to be surrendered to you and it becomes a place of healing so that others would even be able to be encouraged through the testimony. And so God, we give you this time right now and we pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Lord, I pray that for any of us, if we're here today and we're struggling with trusting you, God, may you speak to us. And may you give us the confidence to admit where we are and the confidence to ask for your help. I pray for others of us if we know we've been living in sin, Lord, I pray that we will bring that burden to you to really accept your grace and healing in whatever area causes us to have a barrier to you. God, I thank you for your work in our lives. Lord, may this place be a healing place for your glory. Lord, may the gates of hell not prevail because you are here. In Jesus' name.